Welcome to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hemmerker. In each episode, she'll talk with your favorite romantic suspense authors. They will take you behind the scenes of the writing process, giving excerpts from their writing, and share stories about their writing life. Unintended Target by D.L. Wood Sometimes what you don't know can hurt you. Unsuspecting photojournalist Chloe McConaughey thought she understood her brother Tate, a brilliant programmer willing to compromise anything to get ahead. She just didn't know that included her. When he unintentionally makes her the only link to stolen information a murderous conspiracy is desperate to recover, she's forced to run. Her only ally is Jack a mysterious stranger who is as dangerous as he is charming. But is he her savior or part of their plan? Hunted from the tiny island of St. Gideon to Miami, the pair desperately search for the evidence that will prove their innocence and eliminate them as targets of killers who will stop at nothing to make their problems go away. Hi, and welcome to this episode of The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm your host, Sarah Hammerker, and I'm so glad you joined me. Today, I have D.L. Wood. She's a USA Today bestselling author, and we're going to have a lot of fun, I think. So welcome to my show, Dee. Hey, Sarah. Nice to see you. So um, we, we can go anywhere today because you're like, let's talk about anything. So <laughs> why don't we start with um, what did you want to be as a child, and did that dr dream come true? Wow, that's an awesome question. Um, so actually, as a child, I wanted to be a teacher. Oh. Um, and I ended up being a lawyer. But um, what has been consistent throughout my life is my love of books and love of story, um, particularly epic stories, um, things that have, I guess, um, high stakes drama or high stakes suspense. Yeah. Um, and so I read a lot as a kid, so much so that I think I was eight or nine and the eye doctor said, hey, look, if you don't start reading less or in better light, you're gonna really start losing your eyesight early. So I think he was just trying to scare me a little bit. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so I love stories and used to, I read all the Trixie Belden and the Meg books and Bobsy Twins and all of that. And so um, as, as a kid, I, I think I really had a dream about having one of my books in the library one day um, because I would go, and at that time there were no computers, it was card catalog, right? I grew up in the 70s. So, you know, I wanted, I would have loved to have seen my name in, in that. And so um, I, I think while I had other occupations in mind, I think writing was always something I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, it's funny, because, um, you know, my eye doctor didn't tell me that. <laughs> and he probably could have, you know, as I write, you know, and, and, and most of us who become writers, I mean, if you want to be a writer, you need to read. I mean, exactly. That's, oh, absolutely. You know, you need to read and, and not just, um, you know, not just the genre you're writing with, although I'm sure as you can tell, I read a lot of romantic suspense. Mm -hmm. I love it. I write it. But I also read a lot of other things um, as well. And I think just carving out that time to read, even as an adult, is so important to our writing. So I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about how reading really kind of helps your writing or energizes you to write or what's the relationship? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's pretty undisputed that even so reading for children mm -hmm. helps them develop their vocabulary and helps them expand their um, word knowledge, if you will. And so um, I know that when mine really began reading, um, I could see a huge jump in their literal or their literary capabilities and, and their ability to express themselves. And right. so um, I think the same is true for us throughout life. And even and as authors, it's even more important because, I mean, how often do you find yourself when you're writing, you just kind of fall in those same ruts of maybe using the same phrases or the old, um, you know, terminology or, you know, oh gosh, I've used the word stomach six times in this one chapter, you know? And so I think it's super important because when you read, you're entering other people's minds, you're entering other worlds and you're getting to see how other people 
express themselves and articulate um, uh, situations and feelings and and you learn oh I never thought about you know helping my reader understand what's going on in a particular character's mind that way that's mm -hmm. super effective um, and I, I recently read a book that um, was written so well and in such a different way that than I write and it really inspired me to maybe step outside my box because we we really can you know get in just like any job I think you you yeah. do start doing things a certain way and um it keeps it fresh I think reading keeps it fresh it teaches you right it's that it's and it's fun I mean I, and I do agree I read um I read a lot of suspense, mystery, any of that romantic suspense, but I love also historical fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's got a bit of a mystery to it, that's great, but I'll also read a lot of World War II. I think that's super popular right now, but I've actually always loved World War II stories. And um, I, I could never write that because I don't have the patience yes. to do the research. Yeah, I'm. I am so impressed with anyone that can write a historical novel in any particular historical subgenre that is even remotely accurate. Because just the, the language itself, you know, what things were called and mm -hmm. um, a, a purse. It wasn't a purse. It was a reticule, and yeah. you know, I, I wouldn't know that. And um, so. I, I, I love reading those. It sort of takes me, it's sort of like a little vacation mm -hmm. from myself and my own genre, which I love, but it also does expose you to some other story element, elements and things that you can consider bringing into your own books, right? And yeah. so that's sort of my guilty pleasure. Um, I don't know how guilty it is, but yeah. not, of, <laughs> of, um, I read it, but I don't write it. One of the books, my book that just came out in October has a little bit of a historical twist or a historical um, setting at, in part of it. And um, I, I kept it to a minimum. So I, I could be as accurate as I could. I'm sure there's errors in it. As well. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't hit the mark completely, but, and it was really fun to do. And people love that, seem to love, you know, having a little bit of, oh, I'm going to go back in time a little bit to this. Um, so I was able to bring that thing that I kind of love to read into one of my books. And that was fun. You know, I would do it all the time right. because I don't have the patience for it. But yeah, the, the new, the new series that I have out uh, called the cold war legacy. I have each of the three books. Well, the first one is coming out and the others later, but the, each of them have a little bit of a mystery in 1980s East Berlin. I'm like, I can, oh, do, that wow. then. I can do that Reese, but I don't, yeah, again, it's just a little bit of it. I didn't want to, cause I'm with you. I love yeah. reading my thing. I love reading world war one. Um, okay. Yeah. Else. Um, and I, yeah, I just, I don't have the patience. I mean, I love history. I like to read it. And I thought at one time I might actually make a career of it, but then I was like, nah, <laughs> it's tough. It's okay. Tough, so I have know? to ask you, did you play 99 red balloons the whole time you were writing that book? No, but the, <laughs> the, the soundtrack, yeah. Kind of going through my mind. I have a lot of eighties and stuff and yeah. I remember growing up in that era and just anyways, it was just fun to think, well, that's not it feels like it's way far away mm -hmm. and it's hard. You know, my kids are like the Berlin wall. What's that, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. That was not, and I remember it coming down and you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was just kind of fun to play around with a little bit of history. That's great. Um, yeah. But I, I, I'm with you on the, yeah, I love to read it and I really admire those who, who really dive down and deep into it. Um, it's enough for me just to keep up with the, you know, is this the right gun for this person to have? <laughs> Did I yeah. put a road where a river was? I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> it, it is not easy. There's always that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, so now we've covered, uh, reading and what we want to be <laughs> as children. Yes. And we have a few more minutes. So why romantic suspense? I mean, you talked about liking it. I know you talked about, you know, reading Trixie Belden and Bob yeah. Simmons. Uh, as a kid, I loved happy Hollisters. That was a, I had older siblings, so they had some um, books from the 60s that were like great for me. But um, yeah. so why, why romantic suspense? What, what drew you to this genre to write in? Well, I think those are the books that I, I personally lean towards the most. When I, and it's the TV shows and the movies that I lean towards the most. I watch a ton of BBC. In fact, almost exclusively British programming at this point, like if I'm watching detective series. And, yeah. Um, 
I just love that sense of uh, puzzle. I love puzzles. And uh, so I think trying to figure out what's going on, what's going to happen, um, and, and then hoping to be surprised. You know, I, I love it when I don't guess it. I love it when it comes out of the blue. And it's a really hard thing to do these days because, you know, they say nothing's new under the sun. And, even, and now there's even so many more books coming out all the time. And so, you know, it's hard to do a twist that hasn't been done before. And so I love it when, when you're able to do that. And so I just think I'm kind of drawn to that sort of twisty suspense that um, the, the cliffhanger trying to figure out what's going on. And then I'd like the romantic side of it. Um, I don't, my books are not heavy with romance. So I, I tend to call them suspense laced with faith and romance. So there's usually a faith element, a faith theme. Some are more patent than others. Um, but um, the romance side is, is usually there. But it, and it, again, some of my books, it's a little bit more um, of, a, of a prominent feature. And sometimes it's not. But I, I, I think people, we like happy endings. We like to see people, um, you know, finding that person that um, com completes them or, you know, it, it's it's fun to watch. It's fun to, to read. And so, um, and it also adds just another element of how's this going to turn out, you know? So um, I think I was just drawn to that because it's sort of, it hit all the marks of what I like to see in books, what I like to find in books. And so writing what you know or what you love is super helpful. Um, I, I've read a lot about writing, you know, to market and, and you can certainly do that. People do it extremely well. Um, I've never thought that I would be very good at that because I kind of have to have a personal passion investment in what I'm doing. Not that they don't, I'm not saying they don't, but um, I don't know that I would be able to, I think I've kind of found the thing I, I enjoy doing the most. And so, um, yeah, that, I think it just fit my personality and it's kind of always been what I've drifted towards. Yeah. And I, um, and I hear you about the, you know, the twist. I mean, and I don't mind if I kind of guess where it's going, if it's skillfully done to lead me there. But yeah, well, and so one of, yeah, exactly. Well, I often, so I'll meet with book clubs. I do that and I don't charge to do that. I'll, and now with Zoom, you can, you know, I can do it all over the country. So I'll meet with a book club or, um, you know, talk to readers. And um, sometimes they'll tell me they guessed it. Sometimes they don't. A lot of times they don't. Most of the time they yeah. say they didn't. Yeah. But, or they'll say, I thought it was this person, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. And that's my favorite answer. I'm like, yes. I, that's great. I don't care if you kind of guess it, but you're not sure. I just don't want to give you a situation where you kind of know all the way through. You're never surprised. It's exactly what you thought. Cause then I'm not really giving you the thrill ride you're looking for while you pick up a suspense book. I mean, we kind of want to be um, led through, you know, down paths we weren't expecting. I mean, there's nothing better than like getting to a chapter towards the end. And you're like, what? <laughs> you know, well, yeah. Yeah. I did not see that coming. And so, that's my goal is to give people in my books what I want, which is that whole sense of at least uncertainty until mm -hmm. the end, even if it's not, yeah. even if you kind of have an idea, yeah. um, but I, you know, it all depends on the reader. Some of them are com completely thrown and never, never even remotely guessed. So. Yeah. And I think the and then part of the challenge, I think, in, in writing that is to lead enough clues so that somebody could potentially. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Because we all have read books where you get to the ending and you're like, OK, this came out of nowhere and this was not <laughs> a good like hit you upside the head, like something like totally no crumbs at all. And I've even gone through and like reread books and been like, okay, I just didn't, you know, sometimes you don't pay that close attention, but you know, yeah, cause yeah. that can be very fresh. I don't want my readers to be angry and frustrated when they in the, <laughs> in the book. Absolutely. Well, yeah. and I think that's the challenge of writing suspense is that, or one of the many ones, but you have to um, create a situation where you aren't conveniently providing an answer at the end that has no foundation at least somewhere in the book and and the art of it is lacing the earlier story with those little breadcrumbs so that people do go oh 
Yeah, well, at the time, I thought that was weird that they said that, but I kind of blew it off. Now I get why it was weird that they said that, you know? Yeah. You, you want it, those plants that are important that maybe if somebody's really paying attention, they're like, hmm, okay, now, now I get why that happened. But at the time, I thought it was a little odd and maybe not, I've even, I don't know about you, but I've watched shows or read books and I thought, well, that wasn't very good writing because that doesn't seem very in character. And then later at the end, I'm like, oh, it wasn't in character because this person was pretending the whole time, you know, pretending yeah. the whole time. So I, I agree with you. It's, yeah. it is, um, you, you want to have the twist, but they've got to be well built into the framework of the story, um, to really accomplish, I think, what you're hoping to accomplish with the twist. Right. And, and, and to give that the, like you said earlier, uh, that the readers, that satisfying ending, right. You have the, you have the suspense solved. You have the couple happily ever after. I mean, that's what I think I want to give my readers. And, you know, I know that sounds like what you want to give your readers too, because, you know, I, I can, I'll leave the, the unsatisfying endings to some TV shows or <laughs> yeah. some other authors. But I mean, that's not what readers of Christian romantic suspense want. And I want to no. deliver, I want to deliver what they want. Well, I read somewhere once and I, because it's not my saying, and unfortunately I can't attribute it to the, whoever actually said it, but it said, take care of your reader. I mean, I, I keep that at the focus of my mind when I'm writing because that's who you're writing for. I mean, you can write for yourself and that's fine, but that's not really, um, then you're not writing for the audience. You're not, you're not taking them on a journey. And so sometimes, um, we, you know, we can be self-indulgent and, and write kind of what we're, we're wanting to write in that particular book, but maybe it's not the best yeah. uh, plot line for that character, for what, for what the reader's going to want to have happen by the end. And so, yes, it's very important to always take care of your reader. They're investing their time in you. They're investing their money in you. And, and, you know, I think that that's something we have to, as writers, um, strive for. Yeah. Well, that's a great way to end our show, Dee. So thank you so much for being on today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. You have been listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and I've been talking with D.L. Wood, USA Today bestselling author, and you can listen to an excerpt from one of her books, Unintended Target, after this, and find out more about her in the notes to this podcast. Now an excerpt from Unintended Target by D.L. Wood. It never ceased to amaze him how death could be so close to a person without them sensing it at all. Four hours had passed, and Chloe McConaughey hadn't noticed a thing. It was dark now, and rain that was turning to sleet ticked steadily on the car, draping him in a curtain of sound as he watched her vague gray shadow float back and forth against the glow of her drawn Roman blinds. He was invisible here, hunkered down across the street behind the tinted windows of his dark Chevy Impala, swathed in the added darkness of the thick oaks lining the neighbor's yard. Invisible eyes watching, waiting. Watch, wait. Simple enough instructions, but more were coming. Out of habit, he felt the Glock cradled in his jacket and fleetingly wondered why he was watching her before quickly realizing he didn't care. He wasn't paid to wonder. He was just a hired gun, a temporary fix until the big guns arrived. But even so, he scanned the yard. The dog was gone. She was completely alone. It would be, oh, so easy. But he was being paid to watch, nothing more. Her shadow danced incessantly from one end of the room to the other. Apparently, the news had her pacing. What would she do if she knew she was one phone call away from never making a shadow dance again? Chloe stared down at the duffel, and next to it, the special backpack holding her photography equipment. She double-checked the Terra Traveler ID tags on both and found all her information still legible and secure. Now what? she muttered. 
her stomach rumbled, reminding her that with all the packing and preparation for leaving the house for two weeks, she had forgotten to eat. Rummaging through the fridge, she found a two-day-old container of Chinese takeout. Leaning against the counter, she cracked open the container and used her chopsticks to pluck julienne carrots out of her sweet and sour chicken. Too bad Jonah's not here, she thought, dropping the orange slivers distastefully into the sink. Crazy dog eats anything. Would have scarfed them down in half a second. But the golden retriever that was her only roommate was bunking at the kennel now. She missed him already. He definitely had been the easiest and most dependable roommate she'd ever had, and the only male that had never let her down. A loyal friend through a bad patch of three lousy boyfriends. The last of them consumed twelve months of her life before taking her ring shopping, only to announce the next day that he was leaving her for his ex. It had taken six months, dozens of amateur therapy sessions with Izzy, and exceeding the limit on her visa more than once to get over that one. After that, she'd sworn off men for the foreseeable future, except Jonah, of course, which, actually, he seemed quite pleased about. Not going there, she told herself, forcing her train of thought instead to the sunny beaches of St. Gideon. The all-expenses-paid jaunts were the only real perks of her job as a staff journalist with Terra Traveler, an online travel magazine based out of Atlanta. They were also the only reason she'd stayed on for the last four years, despite her abysmal pay. Photography, her real passion, had never even paid the grocery bill, much less the rent. But sometimes she caught a real gem, like this trip to the Caribbean. Sun, sand, and separation from everything stressful. For two whole weeks. The thought of being stress-free reminded her that at this particular moment, she wasn't. Frustration flared as she thought of Tate's text just an hour before. Flying in tonight, your place at two. Big news. See you then. Typical Tate. No advanced warning. No, I'm sorry I haven't returned a single call in three months. Or... Surprise, I haven't fallen off the face of the earth. Want to get together? Just a demand. A familiar knot of resentment tightened in her chest as she took her wine into the living room, turned up Adele on the stereo, and plopped onto a slip-covered couch facing the fire. Several dog-eared books were stacked near the armrest, and she pushed them aside to make room as she sank into the loosely stuffed cushions. She drew her favorite quilt around her, a mismatched pink and beige patchwork that melded perfectly with the hodgepodge of antique and shabby chic furnishings that filled the room. She tried to remember how many times she'd heard big news from Tate before, but quickly realized she'd lost count years ago. She set her goblet down on the end table beside a framed picture of Tate. In many respects, it might as well have been a mirror. They shared the same large amber eyes and tawny hair, though she let her loose curls grow to just below her narrow shoulders. He had broken her heart more than a little, the way he'd shut her out since taking the position at Inverse Financial nearly a year ago. He'd always been the type to throw himself completely into what he was doing. But this time, he'd taken his devotion to a new high, allowing it to alienate everyone and everything in his life. She brushed his frozen smile with her fingers. Affection and pity and a need for the only person who had ever made her feel like she was part of something special swelled, finally beating out the aggravation she had been indulging. As she set the frame back on the table, her phone rang. Speak of the devil, she thought, smiling as she reached for her cell. Hello? A deep, tentative voice that did not belong to her brother answered. 
Thanks for listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hammerker. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review. You can sign up to receive notifications of upcoming podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhammakerfiction.com.